Rejoiced as though heaven had
We thank you for the risen Savior. We thank you for life abundance through you. We thank you that our sins are no, long, no longer ours to carry. The weight of our sin is no longer ours to bear, but you have taken them to the grave and you've come out victorious. We thank you, Jesus. We celebrate you. We love you. We worship you. Amen and amen. Amen, amen. Welcome, church. You may be seated. It is good to see you all. I don't know that this church has ever seen so many sport coats at one time. <laughs> it is good. Uh, I, I'm doing my part twice a year, maybe. No, it's, but it's good to see everybody. We're just going to continue with our service with the giving of our tithes and offerings. This is an opportunity. If this is uh, your church home, if you consider this your church home, to just to partner with us to contribute to the mission and the vision of this church of transforming people, transforming lives, and transforming our community. Mm -hmm. uh, up on the screen you see just uh, any one of ways that you can give. Uh, we just thank you. We have uh, what, what our giving goes to, what your giving goes to. Yeah. Some things you wanted to highlight within our giving yeah. uh, was our youth um, and kids ministry. As you know, during our Christmas uh, giving, we are doing a playground, and that's in the works. But also, we want to highlight some other things that are happening this summer. Middle school camp is happening June 24th through the 28th. Um, it's going to be a great time for the middle schoolers to um, really just get away, and retreat, and meet Jesus. And we'll also be having VBS again, which is going to be in July. And we'll also have Project Timothy, which is discipling our teens, our high schoolers, to be the next leaders in our church. And so those things we kind of want to highlight. When you, when you guys give to this church, you are giving to those proceeds and these ministries to pour into this next generation. Yes, we are all about the next generation, investing in the lives of the next generation. And so just be on the lookout in the next coming weeks and months for more information about all those things that are going on. You can go to our events page to find out more about those things as well. And Cassie worked really hard on her uh, connect board outside, so you'll see a bunch of flyers for stuff. Um, middle school camp registration is live, and so you'll see a, like a little post-it card where you can scan a QR code and sign up there. Make it an easy technology, it easy. it's great. If you are new with us, we just wanna welcome you. We are so glad to see you. Uh, we're, thank you for being here. We'd love to meet you as well. So uh, to connect with us, there's a number of different ways that you can do that. As Ricky pointed out, the new connect board out on the other side of this back wall, there would be somebody there to meet you and just to introduce you, us to you and get to know you. Uh, if you don't like face-to-face -face interaction uh, with strangers, totally get it. Uh, you can do a very non-confrontational text the word connect to our phone number. And uh, well, it just gives us information about you to connect you to the resources and the ministries that we have going on here and get you plugged in as best as we can, as much as you want to. Also, if you uh, want to meet one of, uh, sit down and meet with one of the pastors or leaders here, just text the word coffee to our phone number and uh, we'll schedule a meeting to sit down and answer any questions that you guys have just to share our heart for this church and for our community and what's going on. And so go ahead and do that if you're new with us. Uh, we've got some more announcements to go through. Yes, we do. That we're going to do. Uh, and Ricky, you're, you're, uh, you're I'll go second. first. Oh, you want to go no, first? No, yeah, I'm, I'm first. I'm okay. sorry. So we have, um, I'm just going to keep talking. <laughs> Sounds so, good. So uh, if you go to our events, uh, LancasterVineyard.org page, you will see this Gospel for the Poor. It's a cohort that's going to meet uh, biweekly on Thursdays. And it's all about getting connected with God's heart for the poor and how we can serve our community and uh, serve the community around you uh, who are poor and in need. So we, I was informed that we do need you if you're interested to register today on our events page to get the information and the content and the materials in time for this first meeting, which starts this Thursday on the 4th. Yes, we also have something very also exciting. We're having a church formal, and this Ooh. is for the whole body of Christ in the church. So, so you're saying another time to wear a sports coat? Another time to wear yes, a sports coat. all right, all right. If you guys want to bring out your prom dress from 1990, you can bring that out too. Um, Ooh. I might have got in trouble for saying that one, but happy Easter. Um, <laughs> But we would love for the whole church family to come together and celebrate. And also, it's just a good time to just dance. Dance? Yeah. Johnny might even dance. Johnny might even dance. He yes. might even a little yeah. groove with yeah. it. 
Hey, and then the last announcement we have from the stage is we have our dinner group starting back up this summer. Uh, they're gonna start back up in May. This is a great opportunity if you're new or you haven't been around for a, a while and you wanna get to know people and uh, have dinner with strangers. It's a great opportunity for you to get connected and, and uh, engaged with uh, the life of the church. So uh, go to events.lancastervineyard.org again to sign up. This is just a great opportunity. We've done it a number of times through the life of our church and it is always one of my favorite things to do because I like to eat and I like to hang out with people. So it's like perfect uh, for, for somebody like me. But if it's, uh, that seems really intimidating and strange to you, it's still a great opportunity to get to meet people and find that the people at our church aren't weird. Yeah. It's really great. So uh, definitely sign up for those. The, the more people that we have, the, the more interactions we get. So uh, it's just an op awesome opportunity to share and, uh, a meal with people and to break bread. So we have one more announcement. It's gonna be on the video and then we're gonna continue with our service. Yeah. In the modern world, there's not much space for life's big questions. Oh my god. Um, is there a map to this? Not much time set aside for. Why am I here? I don't think there's more to life than each other. I think we are the point. Is there more to life than this? Some people dream of finding happiness through money. I like cars. Something awakened in me. It was a realization I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. Where's God in this? Growing up, I've lost a lot of people. I would like an answer for that. Are you real, God? What's the point in prayer? What's the purpose behind all this? We all have different perspectives on the meaning of life. Does faith do more harm than good? It takes a lot for me to trust someone. The Alpha Film Series makes space for the big questions. Each episode unpacks a new topic and gives you time to explore what you think. Try Alpha. El primer día de la semana, muy de mañana, las mujeres fueron a la tumba. Llevaban los perfumes que habían preparado. Ellas encontraron que había sido quitada la piedra que cubría la tumba. Pero, al encontrar, no hallaron el cuerpo del Señor Jesús. Mientras se preguntaban qué habría pasado, se les presentaron dos hombres con ropas resplandecientes. Asustadas, se arrodillaron y se inclinaron hasta tocar el suelo de, con su rostro. Pero ellos les dijeron, ¿por qué buscan ustedes entre los muertos al que vive? No está aquí, ha resucitado. Recuerden lo que les dijo cuando todavía estaba con ustedes en Galilea. El Hijo del Hombre tiene que ser entregado en manos de gente pecadora y ser crucificado pero el tercer día resucitará. Entonces, ellas se acordaban de, de las palabras de Jesús. Al regresar de la, de la tumba, les contaron todas las cosas 
a los once y a todos los demás. Las mujeres eran María Magdalena, Juana, María la Madre de Santiago y las demás que las acompañaban. Pero a los discípulos el relato les pareció una tontería, así que les, no les creyeron. Pedro, sin embargo, salió corriendo a la tumba, se asomó y vio solo las vendas de lino. Luego volvió a su casa extrañando de lo que había sucedido. The teaching text for today comes from Luke 24, 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes, so the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Thank you, guys. Thank you for doing that. I want you to do uh, something here real quick. Will you pull out your phones real quick? Just pull out your phones. We're going to do a little bit of an interactive exercise. Some of you, you don't like being told what to do. Um, so don't pull out your phones and don't do this, okay? But would you just do me a favor? Would you just text somebody, uh, Happy Easter, and just say, whoever comes to mind, I want you to say, I'm thankful for you. I, I truly want it to be meaningful that often on a day like today, we get text, text messages from different people, and some of them proclaim and remind us, hey, he's risen, or hey, I love you, or I appreciate you. Would you just think of somebody in your contact list? Maybe if you don't want to have a phone or you don't want to do this, you can do that to the person sitting next to you. Say, I'm glad you're here. Happy Easter. Bear with me. This has a point, all right? Um, amuse me for a little bit. If you want to do a, a selfie, you get extra points. Um, just want to take, take we're going to take 10 seconds. I want you to send a message to somebody. And I, I want that message to be truthful. I want you that message to say, hey, I, I appreciate you. I love you. So I haven't done that yet. I will do that because my parents, I'll send it to my parents. They're, they're suffering in Easter in Florida, you know? Jerks. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, they'll, they'll, of course, reply back, thanks for being my favorite child. Um, <laughs> why did I have you do this? I, I want you to do this because messages have a power to them, don't they? Messages have a power to point to a reality to bring to light something that another person may not know. And the reason I had you guys do this was uh, a few weeks ago, I got a text from a friend, a friend who I've been friends with, uh, I think almost 20 years, and it was a text uh, that just kind of was out of the blue and just said, hey, Johnny, I'm really thankful for our friendship. I really appreciate you. I feel like if whatever I'm going through, I know I can go to you and, and you're gonna be able to listen to it no matter what. And in that moment, that was a powerful message for me because, again, I always valued our friendship and we, we don't see each other as much as we would like to. But at that moment, it, it was encouraging. It brought to light, illuminated a reality that I have a deep friendship with this person. And this is what messages do. And, and I, this is kind of how I work. I don't know if many of you work this way. I like images. I like frameworks. Uh, and I'm going to put this on the screen because what messages do is uh, messages come from a source that point to a reality. I want you to just let, let that sink in for a minute, is all messages have a source that point to or illuminate to, to show us something that is real. And messages come in lots of different forms, from text messages to phone calls 
to DMs or whatever those sorts of things, to Snapchats. I got, I got some junior hires in here. I'm trying to make it relevant, all right? But uh, a lot of it also messages come to face-to-face -face interaction. And so uh, when my wife was pregnant for the second time, all right, after a couple years of trying to get pregnant, uh, we go uh, to get an ultrasound at roughly around eight weeks. And so, you know, they do the thing where they squirt like the al aloe gel type stuff on her stomach and they bring out that, the, the wand. And, you know, so they're looking uh, at my wife's belly. And uh, then we got a message. Um, and that message was more of a question, but that question was a statement of reality. And she goes, so do, do twins run in your family? <laughs> to which my wife replied, shut the front door. <laughs> True statement, right? And right, so if we go through our framework here, we had a source of a, an ultrasound lady who gave us a message, do twins run in your family, right? To point to a reality that, that something already existed, it just brought to light what something was already there. And that was, you know, two babies in my wife's belly. And so immediately, uh, you know, when you find out you have twins, uh, we went to uh, Krispy Kreme and uh, <laughs> got donuts, because you're like, we might as well you know, do this while we have money. Um, <laughs> so, this is the power of messages, right? It brings, a, brings to light something that has already existed. It's illuminating, illuminating a reality. Now, here's the other side of messages. Uh, I got a message from one of my former youth students, and uh, it just said, hey. And I hadn't talked to this guy in a number of years, so I said, that's weird. And I said, hey, you know, I, I said his name, and, and then I didn't hear back for a while, then all of a sudden I got a, was up, like it was like 1994, you know, commercial. And then it followed by, do you have a cash app? And recognizing this was a scam, right? Somebody either hacked into his uh, Facebook account of some sort and was trying to um, be that source to trick me to, to try to get money from me. And if you guys recognize this, some of this idea through Facebook hacks and all these different things that, that sometimes though messages can point to an unreality. They can point to a lie or fake news as we like to say, or it can point to something that actually doesn't exist, but the goal is to try to make you feel like this is reality. And this is kind of the world we live in in a little bit, isn't it right? That there's all these different instances of people posing for certain things or lies within the media that will try to create a reality for you that doesn't actually exist. Uh, one of those things that happened, I think it was about a month ago, it began circulating online, it was like even got major news, was the news was the Eiffel Tower was on fire. And so there was this, like the scenes of this where uh, there was even a couple different uh, options of this type of of picture of the Eiffel Tower on fire with ambulances and different things, and millions of people saw this. Here's the thing, the Eiffel Tower really wasn't on fire. That somebody, you know, doctored images and that sort of thing, and they tried to create a reality that didn't exist. And here's, a, not to freak you out, right? But now with AI technology, they can actually make, uh, take somebody's voice and you can uh, use that voice to send a message pretending to be somebody. So there's a story of somehow they did this with a daughter or a, a teenage girl, and they called one of the parents using their voice saying, help, I'm in trouble, but it wasn't real. Do you feel like the world we're leaving is a little bit like that, isn't it? That there's all these different messages that are going through uh, all these different ways, it's estimated that nearly 7 billion messages are sent every minute through the Facebook family of apps. I want to repeat that again. 7 billion messages are sent every minute through, face, through Facebook's family of apps. So that includes, you know, Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp, and all that. You think about YouTube and texts and emails, podcasts, radio, TV, uh, even mail. In, you guys still get mail, right? Physical mail. 90%, I mean, you, we just went through an election season, right? And it was like every day you got a piece of mail, message, trying to get you to live or an act under a reality. And here's the truth I want us to get to this morning. The messages we believe determine the reality we live under. 
I want, I want you to just think in a little bit, right? It's the messages we believe that we trust is the reality that we will live under. And we are in a cultural moment where it's hard to know what messages are true. It's hard to know who you can trust. And it's hard to know what reality is, what is real, what is true. And what we're doing this morning is we are looking at a source that we can go to that will always point us to reality. It's always gonna point us to truth if we use it in the proper way, not as a tool to manipulate our message or the reality we wanna create, but if we take this source and live under it and see what is the reality it's pointing to, what we will discover is truth, what is real. And so that's what we're doing this morning. That's what we uh, did this morning, both in Spanish and English. Because here's the thing, here's what's at stake, because it points to the most important message of all time. It, it, it points to the most important message of all time, and that is the Easter message. That is the that has determined the ultimate reality. And no matter, all of us are gonna have to reckon with that message. And uh, so here we are in the story that we read out of Luke 24. We're gonna kind of go through this and, and go through, we're just gonna hang out in Luke 24 for a while. So I'd encourage you to use those phones. Don't be sending messages, all right? While I'm talking, all right? Um, but would you just follow along with me if you're in Luke 24? We're gonna, we're gonna go through this uh, and just go through a big chunk of this. But what we know here at the beginning and what uh, Alicia and Dan read for us is that Mary and these other women, uh, they are going to face a reality. Their whole purpose of attending the tomb was to face the reality that their, their best friend, their rabbi, their teacher, uh, the prophet, they, they facing the reality that he is dead. And so for these women, they, they saw him cru get crucified. They saw him get a spear to the side. They saw him breathe his last breath. It says they also saw him and his, his body being put into the tomb and, and then the, the, uh, the stone being rolled over in front of it. They witnessed that. They didn't need a message for that. They saw that reality with their own eyes. And so on the first Easter morning, they are going to the tomb to face this reality, a world where Jesus is not alive. And yet, when they arrive, the, that, that stone that was in front of the tomb, that, that's rolled away, and they get a message from two angels, which that would be pretty sweet, right? I don't know. I've, I've never had that experience. But they, they get this message from this source of angels, and here's the message, right? He is not here. He's risen. And even if you go back before that, they, I mean, Maybe God has a sense of humor. It's a question that's more about a statement of reality, isn't it? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. And throughout the, the gospels, this is the most important message. Because here's, here's the reality, and I'm gonna say reality a lot in this teaching. There's only two realities that are possible here. This is what everything hinges on, is there's only two realities that, that, are, that are, are at play here. You guys with me? On one reality, Jesus is dead, he's not alive. The other reality is he's alive, he's risen. And, and this is what we have to choose, this is what we have to reckon with, is what we do with that message are those two realities. Because that's gonna determine the life we live under or the reality we live under. And so if Jesus hasn't risen, and let's say his disciples, there was a message for that, the disciples stole his body. And let's say the disciples truly broke in, stole his body, and Jesus is not alive today. What we are doing here is actually not great, right? There's no point to this. Paul would go on to say this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished, if we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. So if we're, if we're, if we are, um, if we've been duped in this Jesus thing, Paul's saying we should be pitied more than anybody. If, if this whole thing is just for this life now, if Jesus hasn't been raised, this is pointless. And to the point where it's not only pointless, it's actually detrimental to our lives. 
But I tell you, friends, that's not the message we believe, is it? It's not the message that we have chosen to live under. Because here's the reality. The first Easter message is our message. He's risen. And this creates a whole new reality for us to live under. If he is risen, everything changes. And that kind of message needs to be shared. But here's the thing. When the disciples heard this message, they didn't buy it. Just hearing the message to them wasn't enough. So if we read on, I'm going to repeat this as what they said. Here's the disciples' response when they heard this message about Jesus being risen. It says, these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what happened. He exclaimed, shut the front door. <laughs> That's probably the message version or something. Um, I like to think how that might go down. But here, just hearing the message wasn't enough for the disciples. It wasn't. They were skeptical. Uh, the disciples say when, they, when the women who, again, were the first people to be entrusted with this, this most important message, when they hear it, it says it just seems like nonsense or idle talk. It just seems like this is, that's crazy town. I mean, he's alive. We saw him die. There's no way he's still alive. See, just even the message was not enough. Even the empty tomb wasn't um, enough for them. And uh, I want you to, I would recognize in a room this size that some of us may be feeling the same thing, that maybe the message of Jesus being risen just isn't enough, that you have maybe heard this message many times, and you haven't actually encountered the reality, though, of his risenness. I want you to do a little math, like try to think through how many times have you heard this message? How many times have you heard the message of Jesus? Yeah, if we, if for some of you, if you got real honest, would you say, man, I, I want that to be true. That sounds really nice, Johnny. I just, I've never encountered that reality. I mean, could you just think about this for a minute? Could you just, just agree with me? If this is true, if this is reality, wouldn't it change everything? Wouldn't it change how you view life? How wouldn't it change the ultimate source of hope that you have, that no matter what you go through in this life, whatever you experience in this life, you could say, it's going to be okay because Jesus is alive. At the end of the day, the end of the story is Jesus is alive. He's on the throne. He's going to come back. And that, that is good news, whether uh, for my kids trying to deal with the idea of a dead dog, to us who experience some of the hardest things of life, from cancer diagnosis to losing a loved one, there is a great hope that knowing that Jesus is alive. He is risen and that he's coming back. But here's this, here's my main point. If you take away anything today, my hope would be this. See, the good news of Easter is not just in the message. The good news of Easter is that you get to encounter that reality in your life. You get to encounter and experience a world with a risen Christ. And that message and that reality changes everything. And that was what changed the disciples. They encountered that reality of Jesus. See, the Gospels don't end here. The Gospels don't end just in an empty tomb. We see the disciples navigating this gap of hearing the message of Jesus' risenness and then actually experiencing it for themselves. And so that's what we're going to do uh, together, is we're going to see how the disciples navigated this gap, because I believe this is the same way we can navigate that gap if you say, you know what, I just haven't experienced that reality. So here we are. We're going to continue on in verse 13. Again, the scriptures are going to be on the, the screen it's, sorry, it's not going to be in Spanish, um, but here we go. Now, that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. And why are they discussing and arguing? Jesus himself came near. Can you just repeat that for me? Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. 
So we know this, there's these two disciples, they've, they've encountered, uh, they, they were two of Jesus' disciples and they, they saw Jesus be crucified and they were actually there when Mary comes to tell them that, that, that this angel appeared and that, that this angel proclaimed to them that Jesus has risen. And so these two are, are walking away from Jerusalem and they are discussing and actually arguing. It's like this picture in the Greek is like, it's like a going back and forth. They're tossing this thing back and forth. And what we know is as they're talking through these things, they are downcast, they're gloomy, and they're distraught. Say so they're not excited about this news, about this possibility of Jesus being risen. They are bummed out. And it says in that moment, when they are in that state, it says Jesus drew near to them. And if you look at this gap and seeing the gap the disciples had to navigate between hearing the news and then actually encountering Jesus, what you will find is pretty much all the disciples doubted they didn't go searching for Jesus. What we see is Jesus drawing near to them. Even Thomas, the Thomas who was like, well, we just got the great nickname of Doubting Thomas. Just imagine that was like what you were known for is like doubting. <laughs> I, I had a lot of nicknames. I don't know uh, where that fits, but um, just imagine. So Do Downing Thomas is like, he's hearing all these, these messages of people encountering the risen Jesus, and yet he goes, unless I stick my finger in his side, and in his hands, I'm not gonna believe. And if you read the scriptures, it says in that moment, a week later, Jesus drew himself to him. Because here's the point I want us to make, as Philip Yancey says, he says, Christianity is not about finding Jesus. It's about being found by Jesus. Max Lucata reiterates that we don't find Jesus, he finds us. He doesn't come to where we are, he comes to who we are. So we navigate this gap not by necessarily searching, but by being found. It's a recognition that Jesus is drawing himself to us. And what we will realize is that Jesus has been walking with us. He's trying to woo us. He's trying to knock at the door, as it says in Revelation. And so... How do, we, how do we get found is, is a great question to ask, because I don't know about you. Um, I don't know how you get found, but one of the things I see here is these are disciples are in the midst of discussing and arguing. What they're, what they're doing is they're being authentic. They're, they are just being authentic. They're being vulnerable to the point when Jesus sees them arguing, he goes like, what are you guys doing? What are you guys talking about? And they, they are real with this stranger. They're saying, they're recounting this, the same thing I just read, that we had this prophet. We thought he was coming to redeem Israel. We put our hopes in him, and yet he's died. And they're like these women, uh, we can't understand it, but they're saying he's alive, and we're in this wrestle. And it says they're just real. They're authentic. And I think that's a really important thing is to be real. We don't have to fake it. Jesus draws to our authentic self. He draws to him, he draws himself to the real us. We don't have to put on a face in order to, to meet Jesus. Jesus wants to meet you. I love how it says, not where you are, but who you are, where you're at. So we navigate this gap, again, not by searching or seeking out. There's still a role we play, but we will see that Jesus, it's, be, it's about being found by Jesus. And because we see that Jesus, you know, it, for, for, for whatever reason, we don't, we're not sure, that they just, they, they can't see that it's Jesus. I don't know if it's like a John Cena thing, you can't see me type thing, it's for like the 10 wrestling fans in the crowd, um, but they can't see him. They, they don't see him. So let's continue on, let's see what, what happens. So we go down to verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So as they're walking, as they're doing that seven mile uh, trip, you know, Jesus calls them foolish. It's pretty, you're like, wow, that's, that's pretty harsh, Jesus. Like you're, just call, you're just calling them foolish? 
And so many of us might think, well, Jesus is rebuking them for their disbelief or not believing, you know, the women or believing the witnesses or even not even recognizing himself. Like, you're foolish, I'm right here, hello. But what is he rebuking them for? He's actually rebuking them for how they view the scriptures or what they thought the Messiah was gonna be all about. See, their, their view of the, the Messiah, what they thought the Messiah was supposed to come and do, didn't fit into the reality of who Jesus was. They were expectant of a Messiah coming in political power to come and to overthrow the, the, the Romans and as they said, to redeem Israel, to put them back in power. That's what they thought the real Jesus was going to be about. That's how they interpreted you know, the Old Testament. And yet, because of that, they don't see the real Jesus for who he is. And one of those things was this idea, as you see Jesus say, wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? So what they're, not, what they're losing sight of, what he's rebuking for them, what their foolishness is lying is, is they can't see how suffering and death are necessary means of divine redemption and eternal hope. That, that death and suffering is is. The only way you can have divine redemption and rescue is coming through suffering and death of one individual. And so he rebukes from that. And so he goes through this, like, imagine being at that Bible study, you know, where Jesus is just going through scripture after scripture. See, pointing to this. I'm sure he, we don't know what he said, but it says he goes through the, the, like the, the, uh, the writings of Moses, which would have been the Torah, the Psalms, the prophets, and he's pointing to himself. But imagine it's like Isaiah 53. It's, the, it's this wounded healer that, that by his stripes we are healed. I, I'd imagine him going through all those things and pointing to that. And so one of the things we have to do, the second thing of how we navigate um, this gap is, is by elevating truth through the scriptures, of elevating reality. See, I don't know about you, when we talked about those messages that are trying to trick you to try to believe a different reality, what is their goal is they've elevated something above truth. They've elevated something above truth. They've, they put power, control, money, right, above truth. And we see that with the guards and the Pharisees and the, and the chief priests is they paid the guards to lie, why? They didn't wanna know truth. They, wanted, they still wanted their power and their control and so they elevated that over truth. And so I think what we need to do is we need to make sure Jesus isn't just what we want Jesus to be or what we think Jesus should be. We need to put, elevate truth above all things to say, I wanna encounter the real Jesus and what he has for me. And that a lot has to do with how we navigate suffering, the times that things get hard. See, isn't this following Jesus, isn't this supposed to make my life just happy and perfect and good? Unfortunately, here's the message we don't often proclaim is, right, is to know the power of, or to know Christ and the power of his resurrections, but to know the fellowship of his suffering, to be conformed to his death. This is part of the message too we have to embrace. We have to elevate this idea that following Jesus doesn't mean life's going to be easier. Unfortunately, it may make life harder. But here's this idea, it's, it is truth, it is reality, and we can elevate that, we will encounter Jesus. And what do you see? The disciples at their lowest point in the midst of great suffering and grief, this is when they are found by Jesus. All right, yet Jesus still hasn't revealed. He didn't go, see, this is about me. They're still blinded. So as they keep walking, this is what happens. That as they're in, they arrive in Emmaus, we, we presumably that they arrive at the, uh, the house of the disciples named as uh, Cleopas or Cleopas. And we don't know if it's his wife or his friend that's with him, but Jesus, unrecognizable Jesus is, is continuing on his journey. And yet they say, hey, you, you need to stay with us. Like come have, it's getting dark out. It's not safe to travel. Will you come into our home? Let's, let's break bread together. And so they, they convince Jesus to come into their house. And here's what we read. As Jesus comes into the house, this is what we read. It was as he had reclined at the table, this is verse 30, with them that he took the bread 
blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. This is like awesome. This is funny, I think. Like as soon as they see Jesus, he's like, poof, gone. Like, what's up with that? Like they just get to see him for like three seconds and he's just gone. I think that's, that's a crazy, right? I want to talk a little bit more about that. But this is what they said. They said to each other, see, see what happens after they encounter this reality, even if it's for a moment. Weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? And that very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They got up, they walked that seven miles again in the dark. They found the 11 and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. They began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. What I wanted the third point here is, uh, I think this is really simple that we could kind of miss, but I think what, what one of the final things is we see them doing is these two disciples were just doing the Jesus-y things. They were putting into practice the things that uh, he had taught them. I'm sure one of those disciples maybe remembered Matthew 25 that said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I think they just started doing the things, they, their faith built up enough to just remember their apprenticeship to Jesus and the things Jesus taught them. And they were just putting those things into practice. They were fellowshipping and, and being hospitable, which hospitable means not just um, you know, inviting your friends over. Hospital, hospital means actually inviting a stranger, taking a stranger and making them feel like family. And this is what they did to Jesus. And as they were doing those things, and uh, I'd imagine just like they were thinking about communion, Jesus breaks the bed, and in that moment, their eyes were opened. They recognized Jesus. This reality, that gap closed from hearing the message and encountering the reality of Jesus. He's alive. Could you imagine the difference between that seven-mile walk and the seven-mile walk that they first had? That how much joy and excitement. They couldn't wait to share that with their friends. And this is what happens when we encountered that reality of Jesus' risenness. It just changes everything. It doesn't mean life's perfect or easy, but it changes how we see things. And as I, I'm gonna, I am closing here, but I, I can remember, this was a few years ago, I was, we were at this uh, youth event, and they actually had a time where youth could come and get prayer. And so I remember these two teenage boys, I didn't know them, they were from a different uh, youth group, and uh, so we had this prayer time for them. And so on one of those uh, teens, uh, we began praying for him. And the Lord just gave us uh, some prophetic messages, some things that we thought the Lord wanted just to, us to communicate uh, to them on behalf of God, which seems like a scary thing, but this is, this is just the way God uses us sometimes to speak into reality or point to reality for somebody. And so I'm sharing uh, just some things that I felt like um, the Lord wanted to speak to this young boy, maybe some things with his past. And he just started like crying and break down but I remember this uh, so distinctly, is after we were done praying, he kept going, this Jesus thing is real. This Jesus thing is so real. I can't believe it. This Jesus thing is, he kept saying it. He'd go to his bike, do you know this Jesus thing is real? And he's like, I know, man, I've been trying to tell you. This Jesus thing's real. They encountered a taste of that reality. And I could tell that that changed everything for them. Now, if I think about my life, it's been these little moments, these little couple second glimpses where Jesus reveals himself and then he's poof, he's gone. Because here's the thing, um, this is a quote I want us to remember. Jesus reveals enough of himself to make faith possible, but only enough to make faith necessary. I'm gonna repeat that again. Jesus reveals enough of himself to make faith possible, but only enough to make faith necessary necessary. What I didn't tell you about the story with my twins, um, and when we found out that message, uh, earlier that morning, it was a Sunday morning, it was during a regular church service, and um, Wendy Sperling comes up to me and, hey, I've been praying about you guys. Uh, I feel like you're going to have twins. 
I think you're going to have twin girls. It was a moment of reality, right? Where I got to taste the reality of Jesus' kingdom and got to then experience it just a few hours later of that reality coming forth. Now, I don't know what you do with that. I don't know if you go ask Wendy what the lottery numbers are after this. <laughs> um, but for me, it was a moment. And here, here's what I think, is uh, whether you've heard this message for the first time or the hundredth time, there's still a gap we have to navigate, isn't there? This thing is a, a gap of faith that as we navigate just even those of us who've experienced that reality, we eagerly anticipate when that gap is closed and we get to experience the fullness of that reality of Jesus coming back. That's our hope. That's how we navigate. So what do we do with that? If you find yourself in that gap, like hungry to have those encounters with reality, I'm gonna give you a few suggestions and, and the worship team can come up. I would ask you to consider Alpha. So Alpha, you saw the little video about Alpha is just a safe place. Uh, it's kind of a place um, to debate and ask questions. It's, you could do the things that the two disciples were doing on their way to Emmaus, that you can ask questions. You can go, well, what about this? Well, what about this? It's, it's a place to just be authentic as you um, just wrestle with this reality, is, is Jesus really risen? And you, you won't be you know, chastised if you believe differently. Um, it's just a safe place where you can do that. And so we're gonna start that the week of April 21st. Next week, we're gonna start a new series out of Ephesians called Eyes Wide Open. Because here's the, here's the reality. Uh, it says the disciples' eyes were opened. And, and this is a, a life of discipleship to Jesus is that as Ephesians will show us, uh, we, our eyes need to be opened and, and enlightened to the fullness of that reality that is available to us. And so we're just gonna work through the scriptures and, and again, allow them to reveal the reality of what it means that Jesus is alive. And so we're gonna start that uh, next week. And so I'd encourage you to join us. But the last thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna take communion together. We see that Jesus did this and, and the way it's worded, you know, this idea of breaking bread, it, it, it often points back to that Monday, Thursday when Jesus had the last supper with his disciples. And, and we did this Friday at our Good Friday service where we remembered the sacrifice of Jesus. But, but this morning, and we not only remember the sacrifice of Jesus, but we take this together to again, to taste the reality that Jesus is alive. You know, in our series before, we, we talked about the role of fasting, that the fasting was a way to experience renewal. And, and it's assumed that the disciples in this gap that they fasted, when you lost a, a close friend, one of the ways you mourned was you fasted. And we see this in all the gospels pretty much that Jesus wanted to eat with his disciples. I mean, we're talking even having fish for breakfast. I, I mean, I don't know how many had fish for breakfast, but he wanted to eat with them. One, to show that he wasn't a ghost. But I also wanted to say, it's a reminder that he said, you don't fast when the groom is here. When the groom's present, my disciples won't fast. But when the groom's here, we're not, we don't need to fast because the purpose of fasting is to experience more of the groom. And so Jesus is just doing a simple thing of, I don't want you to fast. I want you to realize that I'm here and I'm alive. So would you take your bread? And we're actually gonna try to break this little cracker. Would you break it with me? And Jesus, remember that your body was broken for us, but that, that that body just didn't stay broken. It came alive. Let our eyes be open to that reality. Let us eat the bread together. again that the blood that was spilled out for us on Friday is so we can live again on Sunday. We thank you, Jesus, that one day you will take the cup with us in the fullness of your reality of being alive. So we take as a way, to, as, a, as a measure of encountering hope, 
that that will be our future reality one day. Would you hold your cup up? Jesus, we so look forward to the day of taking this cup with you. Where all sin and death are passed away and we would experience the fullness of life with you. Jesus, we love you. We are thankful for you. You have changed everything. We take it together. Would you stand with me? I was doing my uh, little devotional this morning and with the 24 seven prayer app and they had this prayer at the end by Pete Gregg that I wanted to read over us. May this Easter day bring resurrection life to my heart and my home. May renewal radiate within me and revival emanate through me. May dawn displace the darkness and spring replace the winter in my life. May the God of hope so fill me with joy and peace this Easter that I may overflow with hope by the power of his life forever. Amen. Let us worship together.
as a time just to invite the Holy Spirit to come. That Jesus would draw near to us, just as he did to those first disciples. So would you, if you feel inclined, would you, one of the ways we practice this is uh, just hold our hands out just to say, come Holy Spirit. We are hungry and we are thirsty for more of you. So what I'm doing is I'm just waiting, I'm just waiting on the Holy Spirit. We're, we're saying, yes, come. I want more of the reality that you have. I want to experience more. Would you open my eyes to all that you have, all that you want to give me? I'm just going to give a few prayer prompts. I'm going to invite our, uh, just our prayer, our prayer people coming forth, our small group leaders, those who've been trained to pray for people. And we just give space uh, as a way just to, just to say yes to what the Holy Spirit's doing what you feel like God's inviting you to, and it's just a way to allow others to come alongside of you to pray into that. And uh, one of the first things I, as we were praying this week, I was, uh, my whole prayer this week is, God, would, would you open our eyes to the reality of what you have for us? I can't do that. I, I'm, my job is to proclaim the message. Jesus says he will draw near to us. And so one of the things I, I felt this morning was uh, you would say your reality that you are living under, you are longing for a new reality, uh, a reality that is filled with hope. And I just sense that some of you are going through some things and you just need hope. And it says uh, that one of the things that, that God gives us in this reality is the God of hope will fill us with hope. And so if you are in a position where you say, the reality I'm living in, I need hope. I, I need a new reality to live under. Here's the good news. You don't have to stay where you are. Jesus is inviting you to his way of life. And so if you have never said yes to Jesus, if you've never said yes, I wanna become a follower of Jesus. I wanna know the truth. Because tr truth is not just a reality, it's a person. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want a reality of life, and you've never said yes to Jesus, I would encourage you to come up to one of these uh, folks and just say, hey, uh, I want that. I want that reality. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you have everything figured out. You recognize that you will not experience that reality on your own. And so if you want the life that Jesus has, as John said, I've wrote, wrote these things so that you would have life. If you're longing for life and hope, I'd encourage you to come and get prayer. Uh, for some, I just, you are longing for that experience. As you, as you hear this, Johnny, I've, I've experienced certain things. I don't know if I've ever experienced Jesus, the risen Jesus in my life. That's you. I think it's just a good place to admit, just to say, I, I, I'm, I'm navigating that nap. I would like some prayer. But one of the things is we, we give this space for prayer for really for anything. Uh, and one of the things I, I felt too, um, as we were waiting is for some of you, you are longing for some loved ones to experience that reality as well. You are longing for some of your, your family or your friends to know this truth. And the Lord's like breaking you, your heart for them. And so if that's you, I'd encourage you to get some prayer with that. I'm gonna just dismiss us because we're out of time, but we're gonna keep uh, worshiping through this song and then, um, Come get prayer if you want it. So Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you that we live under the best message that there is. That we live in a reality that, that as we've had experience with the Holy Spirit, it's a down payment, it's an inheritance to the things that are to come. And so we walk away, hopefully, walking away with joy and hope as we remember the greatest day in history. We thank you, Jesus, for your life, your sacrifice, and the life that we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, I encourage you to come and get prayer. Happy Easter. Get your picture taken if you want. We'll see you next week.